Welcome Spartans. Welcome to the UD Scoop virtual event right here at our campus home. I am Katie Kraus. And I'm Melissa Hemisath. And of course, you all know Sparty. <laughs> and on behalf of myself, Sparty, and all of us in the Office of Advancement, we are so glad that you could join us for today's event. And although we have greatly missed seeing you in person throughout this year, we are so glad that we are able to see you virtually for today's event. That's right, Katie. On behalf of all of us at the University of Dubuque, thank you for your continued investments in this very important mission. One of our favorite things to share with you when, during visits and events are the stories of our wonderful students. Today, we're delighted to introduce you to Trey and to Morgan as they prepare to graduate this spring along with thousands of other students they haven't forgotten who's made their UD journey possible. Through your support of academic and athletic programs, research and travel opportunities, and student scholarships, you are helping make dreams come true. Hi, I'm Morgan Meerstein. I am a senior this year. I am from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I will be graduating in May with a double major in sports marketing and management as well as human resource management. Trey Moss, I'm a senior, senior here at the University of Dubuque with a major in psychology and a minor in sociology. I'll be graduating this uh, upcoming May, um, and then I'll be moving to grad school at St. Ambrose University in a master's social work program. When I visited UD, it was very much that small town feel within the campus. I knew that where I was coming, I mean, small classroom size made the professors very knowledgeable and very sociable, and I loved that because that's what I grew up. It was the campus tour what really made me feel like home. It was just really, like, it was welcoming, and I just, I felt like this was home, and so, so I chose to stay here at UD. Just from being on the basketball team, that was my first group of friends, and now my roommates and I mean we have five seniors this year so that's a, a group I've gone through four years with. Yes, uh, so coming in my freshman year I was a little scared and nervous that I was not going to be able to be able to succeed um, here at college just because I got a 13 on my ACT score and it took one professor, uh, my English professor my freshman year who really saw um, just me and so with them being able to just like support me and be there it definitely shaped uh, into the man and the student um, I am today. I don't know what I would do without my faith and that's always been a staple in my life. That was something that I didn't really think too much about coming into college. Like it wasn't a, hey, I'm gonna go to a school that has a church on campus. Like that wasn't something that I was looking for to be honest and it just wasn't a priority and I'm really glad it happened the way it did. And obviously God always has a plan because he knows what he's doing. So. I just gotta say I really appreciate the people that, you know, never met me, don't know who I am, to just be willing to just give. The financial aid and the scholarships that I have gotten have helped me get through four years in four years. And I think just without them I wouldn't be, you know, finishing off my uh, undergrad and then going on to grad school without their support and help. I just want to say thank you. I mean, again, even if it's small amounts like I don't think everyone understands how far that goes and it could be on the sending end and it could be on the receiving end but I was always told any small amount is going to add up and it really has, it truly has. So I really appreciate um, just their support again. <laughs> I say thank you for supporting in me, believing in me even after probably never having met me so <laughs> that's really cool and I just want to know or like I want them to know that it got put to good use. UD is definitely a home for me. UD became a home for me because I found family here and I got to grow up with that family just like I did back home in Green Bay. Just to know that I'm about to leave, you know, my support, my home base, but I know that I'm leaving my school off in good hands. When I go home to Green Bay, I enjoy it, but I'm ready to come back and I'm ready to come back home here. So that's always cool because I don't ever feel like I'm in a place where I don't belong. It's just somewhere I will continue to come back to and later on in the future I'll be given, given back just as uh, the donors did me.
From the moment I stepped on this campus, it has felt like home, and I have been blessed to meet so many amazing people. And it is now my honor to introduce one of those amazing people here today, whom we frequently see on campus and knows us all by name, Dr. Jeffrey Bullock. Trey and Morgan, thank you very much for that, that wonderful reflection of your years here at the University of Dubuque. Uh, we certainly, and I certainly, hate to see you go, uh, but we really look forward to welcoming you uh, into the UD alumni family. And friends and University of Dubuque alumni family, we want to welcome you to this virtual event. Uh, you know, we, we'd rather be in person, but one of the things we've learned during this period of time and that it, is that it's important to continue to innovate uh, and to do things a little differently, to experiment a little bit, to take some opportunities. <clears throat> and I think we've discovered uh, that one of the things, uh, at least that we hear from you regularly, is that uh, you've enjoyed the different ways we've tried to reach out to you. And I, I really want to uh, just thank our alumni team, our advancement team, uh, so ably led by just such a wonderful person and Melissa Hemeseth, Katie Krause, and the entire team uh, for bringing us to you. And I want to thank all of you for your continued support of this wonderful mission known as the University of Dubuque. Now my job today is to try to give you a brief update on, on some of the key points of this, this past year and, and how you, uh, as uh, people who love this mission, uh, might be even more engaged than you already are. And, you know, I can't uh, not do an update without first talking about COVID-19. And I don't want to spend all of my time talking about COVID-19, but it has informed this year. In fact, it was almost a year ago to the day uh, that we began the serious conversations of what do we do post spring break? And uh, everything was changing at that point. Uh, and we had to make a lot of uh, quick decisions. Uh, fortunately, we were able to appoint a COVID-19 response and recovery task force. And the COVID-19 uh, task force led by Amy Edmonds has done such a wonderful job of helping our community be safe and be smart. In fact, one of the first decisions we made, and it was a little controversial at the time, uh, was that we were gonna put our stake in the ground and in the fall, we planned to reopen in a face-to-face -face environment. Now, our goal then was to put the stake in the ground to make that commitment and to figure out a safe way to get there. Well, we were able to do so thanks to the leadership of, of this group and thanks to the commitment of our faculty and staff. One of the things that I was, I think, proudest of over the course of this last year was about late spring as we were trying to decide you know, what that fall would look like, a number of our faculty had said to our Dean, Mark Ward, that they believed we had a moral responsibility to be in the classroom with students, that the kind of education we offer here demands a kind of incarnational encounter, a kind of relationship building uh, between faculty members and students and staff and students and, and, and each other. And we've been able to do that and do that well in both a face-to-face -face environment and for faculty members and staff members who might not feel uh, as safe through a synchronous environment. Uh, that is online, but in real time. So um, in addition to that, we've implemented a very rigorous training or testing program in August, uh, and we've tested uh, over 4,000, 5,000 uh, individuals over the course of this year. We now have access to rapid tests and I'm really pleased to report that our infection rate, even at the highest, was about one and a half to two percent. We got to two and a half percent for one week, and now we're well below one percent. In fact, I think we're one tenth of one percent as our infection rate here on campus, which is uh, pretty much close to, to nothing. So a couple of you have asked questions. You know, one of those questions would be, you know, what are the plans for the campus safety of students, staff, and faculty in a post-COVID environment? Well, our team is busy planning that right now, and we anticipate uh, that we will be face-to-face, -face, but with modifications, uh, that we're going to continue uh, to be safe, uh, to desanitize classroom space regularly, uh, to, to implement new procedures, mask procedures, for example, uh, as an option for people, uh, particularly during flu season here in the upper Midwest. So there's a way for us to continue to be safe, to be smart, and to practice our mantra, 
or a modified version of our mantra. And what is that mantra? Well, practice common sense. And in this environment right now, that means good hygiene, uh, that means uh, social distancing, and that means using face coverings for ourselves and for the safety of others. What's undergraduate and graduate enrollment been like? That's been a question many of you have asked. And if you read the national news, you know uh, that colleges and universities across the country have been decimated uh, by this experience. In fact, in, in our industry, over 650,000 jobs have been lost since February of 2020 uh, because of COVID-19. And I very much anticipate uh, that that rate will continue uh, into this next year. Um, we've been blessed. We have not lost one position. We have not terminated one position because of COVID-19. We've been able to keep ourselves steady. Uh, we've been very disciplined and we're all very grateful. Uh, but on top of that, our enrollment numbers, uh, we surprised everybody, even ourselves, and not only met, but slightly, not only met, but slightly exceeded our enrollment goals. Uh, and we expect the same to be happening this fall. It's a very challenging time to recruit in, in undergraduate uh, and in higher education uh, specifically, particularly in the demographic of the upper Midwest where we're shrinking in population. But we've got a great team, we've got a wonderful mission, and we've got people who are committed to executing that mission. So we will be successful, and it will be hard every single day. So one of the things you can do to help us out is, is if you know somebody is looking for a college home, refer them to us. If you're looking to somebody who's thinking about theological education, refer them to us. In fact, our theological and seminaries enrollment is the highest it's ever been, and, and we're grateful for that. Now, interestingly enough, uh, we had no tuition increases last year, and we're only committing to a 1% tuition uh, increase, percent increase uh, this year, which again is unheard of. Uh, our goal is to keep student debt to as low as we possibly can. Uh, we run a pretty frugal environment around here. Uh, we don't spend money ostentatiously or frivolously. Uh, because we believe uh, that, that our responsibility is to provide the highest quality education at the lowest po cost point possible. One of you asked, for example, or is familiar with the importance of endowment. And by the way, our endowment exceeded $200 million this year, which is amazing given we started at about $13 million 20 years ago. Uh, personally, as we move into another campaign, I hope uh, the trustees will concur with that initiative. Um, I'd like to see that endowment get to $500 million within the next five to six years, but that's going to be dependent upon the depth uh, of the support from our alums, from our friends, and from people who love this mission. Now, what will that endowment be focused on? It'll be focused on students. It'll be focused on student scholarship. It'll be uh, focused on student academic support services because one of the challenges of COVID uh, has been the number of students who are further and further behind in their preparation for college level work. That work has to be made up. It's not going to be made up in their schools. It's going to end up on our front porch. And so we've got to figure out a way to provide the massive amounts of support services to help students transition from high school to college and to really use those first two years of their college experience for uh, increase growth so they can go on and to live the kind of lives that, that they want to live and we want them to live. Right now our endowment supports about 15% of what we give away in, in student financial aid and we give away about $25 million a year to students uh, in student financial aid. Our academic programs have, have really continued to fare very well during this year and I'm very proud of our professors and our faculty and our staff members for the work that they have invested in. It, it's been grueling work for them. In addition to their regular preparations, there's two preparations because it's a regular classroom and the synchronous environment demands that they also teach through a computer in real time. That's hard to do and uh, they've invested a massive amount of time in, in perfecting that and I think they're getting uh, better at it and I'm, I'm really proud of them. Our physician assistant program is doing well. It continues to grow. Our students, uh, we, 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 fortunately, we're beginning to find more and more uh, placement opportunities for our students. And again, as alums, uh, if you would want to reach out to us, if you've got an extra bedroom, if your home is kind of quiet uh, and you'd like some, some life in that home again, please, we are looking for people to help 
uh, serve as residence for our students to give them a place to stay. It helps lower their costs. Uh, maybe it brings more joy to your life and you certainly help those students and the mission of the University of Dubuque. Our Veteran Center is also continuing to do well and stay engaged as well as our ROTC program with over 40 students in that program. Uh, and I think about 30 of them, 25 to 30 of them are also scholarships. So that continues to do well. And as I mentioned, our seminary and our graduate programs uh, continue to do well. One area we haven't talked about is our life programs, and, and those life programs are accelerated programs for working adults. We have those life programs in Dubuque, Cedar Rapids, uh, Tempe, Arizona, and Boise slash Meridian, Idaho. Uh, so look at our website and you can learn more about those life programs, but they too have struggled uh, during this COVID period, but we're expecting a pretty healthy rebound uh, once vaccinations take hold across our nation and, and people are back uh, to wanting to, to advance their, their position in their various companies uh, in, and communities. Um, I got several questions about our aviation program. The aviation program, or our industry, has been decimated, of course, with COVID. And yet this last fall was the largest enrollment we've ever had in our aviation program. We have a new flight center out at the Dubuque Regional Airport. Uh, we're looking for funding to eventually build um, a, a new set of hangars uh, for our 25 planes and five helicopters. Uh, we expect a very robust uh, enrollment in that program again this year. Uh, and it is rated as one of the premier uh, flight aviation programs in the country. So we need to keep it that way by investing not only in our physical resources, uh, but our flight resources as well. And eventually, uh, we'd like to acquire another plane that allows our students to get even uh, better experience at higher altitudes and particularly moving into more private aviation, corporate aviation. Um, our theological seminary continues to do well. Um, we're one of the few seminaries in the country that was online before uh, they had to go online. Our seminary has been operating that way for almost 15, uh, close to 20 years now in some hybrid format and, and we're the leaders of that delivery system in the country. Uh, our seminary has been very nimble on its feet and I continue uh, to believe that they'll continue to be nimble, will continue to grow uh, and will be really making a difference in small communities and larger communities throughout the country as we move into our future. Uh, right now, 163 students are involved in our, uh, uh, enrolled in our seminary. Most of those are Master Divinity uh, uh, and, and Doctrine Ministry students, but we also have uh, certificate programs, Master of Arts and Missional Christianity and, and other opportunities as well. Uh, intercollegiate athletics was really uh, tipped upside down this fall is the best way to say it. And, what I'm really proud of is that, that our school and our coaches and our athletic administration helped lead the way in insisting that our student athletes had an opportunity to participate, but participate safely. Uh, students, college students need activity. They need social interaction. And the worst thing that we can do to our students and our children is to isolate them from each other and from that social interaction. So many of our fall sports have been moved to the spring. It's a jam-packed spring. We're playing football this spring, playing soccer, softball, baseball, uh, lacrosse, uh, volleyball, wrestling, men's and women's basketball, and I'm sure I've left something out, sorry, uh, track and field. Uh, but it's a busy spring, but a good spring, and yes, uh, fans are welcome. In fact, our men's basketball team's undefeated this year. We're 12-0, and we're playing Coe College tonight. If you can't be there in person, uh, live stream us and, and cheer us on. I'd like to see them win the conference tournament. They're ranked seventh in the country right now. Um, finally, uh, a couple of other items that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the importance of our annual fund and our endowment. And I want to thank you because there are many of you uh, on this live stream today who've done what I used to call in my church life extra mile giving. Uh, you've given your, your normal, your regular, your consistent investment in the University of Dubuque and its mission, but you've also understood that this is an unprecedented time and that we need additional support. Our students need additional support. And that's what the annual fund is for. The vast, vast, vast percentage of your commitments that come in for the annual fund are earmarked for student scholarships. 
Students need your support and now is a great time to support them and to continue to support them. We call it paying it forward. If you've been blessed, be a blessing to others. If, if you normally give $500, challenge yourself to give $1,000 and give it in the name of a loved one or, or a, a son or a daughter or a grandparent or a parent. Uh, give a scholarship in their name and so a student knows uh, that investment is being made in them because of love and affection uh, for someone else. Our endowment is, is critically important for the life and the well-being of the university. It's grown to $210 million and we're grateful for that. And if we want to continue to be the university our mission invites us to be, we've got to find a way to grow that endowment and that's why I'm hoping uh, that our trustees will move into a campaign that is focused almost exclusively on the endowment here at the University of Dubuque. If that endowment can be focused on student scholarships, student support, faculty and staff support, this place will be a place really very, very unique in the higher education stratosphere uh, in America. Um, we, we're very active in events on campus. You've, we, we've had virtual commencements. We've had semi-face-to-face -face commitments commencements. We've had a virtual homecoming. We're planning on a face-to-face -face homecoming this October. If you're not comfortable, we'll also make it available virtually, but we'd love to see you here. We've got shows at Heritage Center, uh, and we have an upcoming service of Thanksgiving in Remembrance, and that's for us to give thanks for the lives that have invested in this university who've now entered the church triumphant. Finally, as I wrap this up, our campus hasn't been quiet, even though the world around us has been. We've completed Opus 97, which is the John and Alice Butler pipe organ, and its debut will be in May uh, for the dedication service. It's one of the premier pipe organs uh, in the upper Midwest. It has gotten international acclaim already, uh, and we're really looking forward to this new opportunity for service uh, and for sharing joy in our community. We're in the process of updating our website. You'll see that in the next couple of uh, days or weeks. And we've added Alumni Common and the Veterans Memorial. Uh, we've added the Smeltzer Kelly Student Health Center, and what a perfect time uh, to be adding a student health center in this time. Let me tell you, we've served thousands of students over the course of this year. We've completed the Peter and Susan Smith uh, Welcome Center, and we've dedicated both of those new buildings in the fall. And then we're gonna pivot now and do the final bit of, of renovation here on campus and we'll renovate Severance Hall, Van Vliet Hall, Aitchison Hall, hopefully Alumni Chapel, uh, and actually bring all the facilities up to date in a way that, that uh, is really a blessing to the next generation of students and leadership and faculty and staff here. So I've got much more to say. I'll hopefully be able to uh, uh, attend to some of your questions and some more information in a few minutes as we move into a time of questions and answers. But right now, I'd, I'd like you to uh, welcome with me uh, our friends and our colleagues from the Advancement Office who are going to give you a tour of this absolutely beautiful and wonderful campus. Thank you and, and continue enjoying our time together. Welcome, welcome Spartans. I've been here for 64 years dating way back to 1957 and I want you to know there's lots of changes that have occurred and we want to make sure we show those to you even though it's virtually but we're going to give you all those changes up to date in the tour ahead. The first stop on our tour is the Alumni Common. There are ornamental crab trees that encircle the common and they were planted to replace the ash trees that fell victim to the ash borer disease. Here in the center of the common is seating and an oak tree that provides shade for students to gather. Seating is plentiful in Alumni Common, including the beautifully colorful Adirondack chairs. And speaking of the ash trees, Sparty here was carved from one of the ash trees that stood here in Alumni Common. The Vietnam Memorial has been enhanced and expanded and is now known as the Veterans Memorial. This sacred ground holds the names of the service members who lost their lives in service to our country. 2020 marked the fifth year of the existence of the Jeffrey B. Dodge Veterans Center. 
and we look forward to celebrating the fifth anniversary at Homecoming 2021. The Smeltzer Kelly Student Health Center was dedicated back in September of 2020. Since that day, we have helped nearly 1,000 students with medical issues. We've helped nearly 400 students with brain health issues. The health center currently offers procedure rooms, examination rooms, office space for brain health issues and counseling, and office space for health and wellness. We hope to complete this building this summer in 2021 and add more office space in a room for group therapy. Linda Calapity Hall, preparing the next generation of healthcare providers. One thing we've learned from this pandemic is just how vital our medical care providers are for small communities, our nation, and our world. Although it's been a challenging year, that did not halt our third class of PA students from graduating in December of 2020. These students are now out making a difference from Redding, California to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The next stop on our tour is Wallace Common. This beautiful space was named in honor of longtime professor, Reverend Dr. Howard Wallace. This area boasts of almost five acres of land and is a beautiful gathering space for students across campus. This is now the new center of campus with lots of trees, landscape, and chairs to sit, relax, and enjoy each other's company. This area is also home to the re-envisioned Lobby Bell Tower. The cross from the original Lobby Bell Tower is embedded in the new tower. The new tower represents an open gate, welcomes students in, and symbolizes the broad and bright future that a transformative education can provide. The newest addition to campus is the Peter and Susan Smith Welcome Center. This building was dedicated in September of 2020, and it's through these doors that prospective students and their families will get to see the University of Dubuque for the first time. The Welcome Center is also home to the Multicultural Student Center, a place for students to gather, build friendships, and learn about one another's cultures through food, conversation, study, and programming. On the lower level, there's a large auditorium and classrooms on both levels, including math and education spaces designed specifically for those area of study. And on the third floor, that's where you're gonna find us, the Office of Advancement and Alumni Engagement. We're so thankful to be in this beautiful building right here in the heart of campus, and we cannot wait to welcome you back on campus to see us here in the Peter and Susan Smith Welcome Center. From one end of campus to the other, the mission at the University of Dubuque is alive and well. But it's not these beautiful buildings and lush landscaping that truly make a difference here at the University of Dubuque. It's our students, our faculty and staff, and it's you, our alumni, our friends, and our investors. Thank you, and God bless you for being a vital part of the University of Dubuque. Hello everyone and welcome back and, and I hope uh, that you enjoyed that campus tour and uh, however I will say there, there's, there's no substitute for the real thing. Uh, so when you're back in the area, if you're back for homecoming, uh, really take your time and, and treat this campus as we try to treat it and that's as a park. Uh, we try to take care of it, we understand that it's, it's beauty and we want it to be a welcoming and inviting place, not just for our alums and our friends, uh, but for our neighbors, for our community, and certainly for our students. So now I've got a few minutes with you to respond to uh, a few of your questions. Some of you have just sent questions in, and I'll take them and not necessarily in any order. And I want you to enjoy your ice cream uh, while we're having these questions. So I already ate some of mine, so I won't do that now, but I want you to really enjoy that ice cream. I particularly like the Invest Mint, you get that? Those of you who are eating the Invest Mint, there's a subtle kind of a, a cue or a subtle hint for you there. Uh, Invest Mint, University of Dubuque, Mission, you kind of see the connection. Anyway, we got the first question here. Uh, can you compare enrollment now to 1965? Now, I'm not gonna say who asked this question. Uh, I was a graduate of the 1965. I was in kindergarten in 1965. 
I think the enrollment in those years was maybe 500 or so, maybe 600, uh, and uh, maybe a graduating class of, of about 80 or 90, I think. Uh, today, overall, our, our enrollment is around 22 to 2300. Um, here's a really good question. Um, somebody asked, can you please talk about the farm property uh, that was given to UD? Where is it? How will it be used, et cetera? Well, uh, what this person is talking about is a place that we know as Walter Woods and Prairies, and it's owned by a wonderful couple who approached the university about six months ago as they were, uh, they've worked on this property, they've developed this property and re restored it back to its natural beauty. And uh, the university has partnered with uh, this family for about 10 or 15 years through its environmental science program. And uh, um, anyway, uh, doing research, helping to restore the prairie, et cetera. Well, uh, through the generosity of a, of a wonderful investor, the university purchased this property, uh, Walter Woods and Prairies, which is located north of the university, uh, about a half hour drive away in Cheryl Balltown, right on the Mississippi River. It's 121 acres of unglaciated uh, uh, land, prairies, uh, four acre organic garden, and a beautiful home that will serve as a retreat center, a meeting space for our faculty and staff and board members and, and alums. So we're really looking forward to this. If you'd like to see what it looks like, if you have an Instagram account, just search Walter Woods, W-O-L-T-E-R, Woods, it'll pop up, UD Walter Woods, start following us. Uh, and you'll see uh, through our, our caretaker, Eric Nye, another alum uh, from the University of Dubuque, you'll see regular pictures and postings of news and activity at Walter Woods. On March the 20th, we have our first annual bird count uh, that begins at 7 a.m. and goes till dusk. And everyone who'd like to participate is welcome. You can do this for 15 minutes or 12 hours, whatever you feel uh, comfortable doing. The next question is, we'd, we'd love to hear more about the next building project at the University of Dubuque. Um, you know, we, we participated in, I don't know, 35 or 45 building projects over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and, and we're really getting to the point where uh, there's always something to do, uh, but the campus is pretty well built out. Uh, we hope to be acquiring Grace Street from the city, for example, and we'd like to turn that into a park that, uh, parkway that connects uh, what we used to call the North and South Campus. Uh, but my dream, really, and maybe some of you might be interested in helping to fulfill this dream, uh, is, is a building that would really focus on the fine arts. Um, why the fine arts at a time uh, when, when so many uh, schools are moving away from, from the arts? Well, the answer is really simple. Uh, we're, we're a school that has really been uh, fortunately very smart about our curriculum. Uh, we're a professional university with a liberal arts core. And over the last 20 years, as you all know, there's been a lot of emphasis in what's called STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And those programs are great programs. The problem is those programs have often been offered and, and replaced programs like history, like civics, uh, like American history, world history, uh, like philosophy and critical thinking and, and the developing uh, communication skills. And the arts help in those things. They help us express ourselves as human beings. They also help tremendously with our students who struggle with some brain health issues, and I wouldn't even say struggle, who, who have learned how to manage their brain health issues with anxiety and depression, uh, et cetera. And um, if you're interested in a program like this or a project like this, please let us know because, because we think it's the next thing. Uh, and if we can build enough support, uh, perhaps uh, it can happen. Um, oh, here's one from, our, uh, <laughs> from, the, from the mayor of Dubuque, our former director of grounds and landscaping. Will the university be applying for a tree campus USA designated during the next year? We will now. Okay, and uh, here's a very important question. Uh, there are aspects of uh, campus life and learning uh, that have changed permanently because of COVID. So your future students who are presently in elementary and high school have had their entire view of life indelibly stained by fear, stress, and disappointment. We can imagine the problems this represents, but with problems come opportunities. What possible opportunities for the university lie among the ruins of this pandemic? Isn't that a great Great, insightful question. Here's what I'd say. 
say we're a faith-based university. We're a faith-based environment of teaching and learning. And we're focused on the intellectual, the spiritual, and the character formational elements of our beings as human beings. And as we help uh, teach students and as we learn from students, we begin to realize that that kind of person, that kind of human is part of the solution uh, to the challenges not only facing our communities and our country, but facing our world. Our goal is to help nurture students for lives of purpose, lives of hope, and live their lives in a way without fear, with hope, purpose, and without fear. You're right, this COVID opportunity has scared lots and lots of people. We think a place like the University of Dubuque can help be part of the solution uh, rather than uh, part of the problem. Finally, um, I think one of the questions uh, that, that we'd like to talk about is, and conclude with, is how can you how can you help? How can you continue to invest in the University of Dubuque and its future? I can't stress enough that the most important priority at the University of Dubuque is its mission. And its mission is about the formation, the intellectual, spiritual, and character formation of its students, all of its students. 18-year-olds uh, in the traditional undergraduate program, theological seminary students, uh, and 58-year-olds in our LIFE program for accelerated learning and adults. That's what we're about. We're about preparing people for service. We're about preparing people to make a world a better place because of their presence. And we're about preparing people in an environment that looks like the world around us, an environment that is very diverse, uh, that is very complex, but is also very tolerant and works hard to be tolerant and understanding of different points of view and different perspectives and different backgrounds and experiences. People who learn in that kind of environment are people who go on to lead in our world and our society. And that's why I'm excited about this mission and that's why I hope you continue to support this mission both now and in the future. So thank you very much for your time with us today and at this point I'd like to Turn it back to Katie as she brings us all home. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, President Bullock. And we hope that all of you have enjoyed today's UD scoops of thanks. But now we want to see all of your smiling faces. So grab your flat Sparty and let's take a Zoom photo showing just how far Sparty and our great Spartan spirit has traveled for today's event. Once again, thank you all for joining us for this virtual event. It was so great to see you here today. And as we end this call, we have a variety of student photos of them sharing their thanks to all of you for everything that you do for the University of Dubuque. But of course, we cannot wait to see you in person, whether it be right here on our campus home, at an alumni event, or during a personal visit. But until then, Take care, be well, and remember, it's always a great day to be a Spartan. <laughs>